Good evening, everyone. I thank you for joining me again. Um, Psalm 23 uh, is also one of my favorite psalms. And, uh, and, and we have all memorized it, and, and I suppose we could sing uh, the song. And, and it has brought much comfort and solace to, to many of us. Uh, this evening, I would like to spend a little bit of time not preaching to you about Psalm 23, but really to unpack the Hebrew underneath Psalm 23, uh, mainly because many of us don't read Hebrew uh, and, and uh, we are unable to actually uh, uncover and hopefully we can uncover some new things uh, with Psalm 23. Not so much to change the whole story of Psalm 23, but to gain uh, the, the nuances and, and the depth of the message in Psalm 23. Uh, this follows our previous uh, psalm, which is Psalm 1. And in Psalm 23, it's a very interesting psalm because it's a short psalm, but a very, very popular psalm because it encourages. Now, this picture here, uh, I was told, uh, is a picture of sheep in the terrain of Israel somewhere. And looking at the terrain like this, it is most likely in the in the springtime, you know, when there's lots of grass and stuff like that. Now, we don't know the environment uh, where David was as he penned the psalm, uh, but whatever that may be, we hope to glean some, uh, some good nuggets that we can encourage us further. I want you to understand as we begin that we are talking about a psalm uh, which is regarding Jehovah, the God of Israel, the God of David, right? And, and the God that we worship. And I need you to also remember that he is known as what God calls him, a man after his own heart. Uh, and, and that's recorded in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. And so given that background, I, I, I hope that we can see it from this perspective of a relationship between God and David. And not just any man called David, but this particular man, David, who is a man after God's own heart. And then we could see how the song reflects this relationship. Now, many a times when we read this, we just like the music and the rhythm and the poetry in English. But I think the Hebrew gives us a whole lot more in terms of depth and dimension. I hope you can observe three things uh, today. Now, these three things are interesting because uh, if you're not aware, and you should be now when we get into Psalm 23, that Jehovah is the first and the last focus here, meaning, the entire encapsulation of the psalm is really about God. It's not about how we live and stuff like that, but it's about God and how he interacts with this man called David. Now, in the same psalm, you will be able to see that David actually knows God. David actually has a relationship with God. And not only he knows God, he also knows how God works. And that's described in the psalm. And in so doing, I hope that as we focus on Psalm 23, from a different perspective, as we dig under the Hebrew, we should be able to point our focus on God himself. It is to tell us who God is to David. And that should be how God is to us as well, principally speaking. So let's look at some introduction. The entire psalm gives us a vivid imagery. Imagery means that this is about the, the, the idea painted in the minds. And I have been stressing this, that Hebrew is actually a, a listening language. That as Hebrew is being spoken, it is supposed to conjure in our minds the vivid imagery and, I mean, for, for our contemporary present-day illustration, it would be a video played in our minds. 
And that's how we would see uh, this psalm. Now, we have always tried to read the psalm and sing the psalm, but tonight I hope that you can actually imagine the psalm so that we can actually understand this a lot better. This psalm speaks of activities, which means that it is always active. It talks about action. And, and I've also mentioned to you that verb is king in Hebrew because it is to help the audience to play those actions in the mind. You can't play abstracts in the mind. You have to play actions in the mind. But these are activities that is common to David as a person in his life, as a shepherd, as a warrior, and as a king. Now, these three tells us that we will be able to handle the entire text if we see it from this perspective. Now, the other thing I, 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 I will keep stressing is this. It is about David's relationship, all right? It's David's relationship with God. That's how the entire psalm is structured. It is not structured to tell about his uh, witness, testimony, and whatnot. It is about his relationship with God, how he knows God and from his perspective of things. And one last point is this. I think it is important for us to realize that the psalm is actually not complicated. If we run into confusing and complicated understanding, uh, I, I would suggest that we have to relook at it again because that's not the intent of the psalm. The intent of the psalm is to give us simple principles but painted in poetic imagery language so that you can actually hear the rhythm, the sound, and the picture all at one go. So let's look at Psalm 23 verse 1. Now I'm going to show you how the psalm works and then hopefully you can follow and figure out how, how we should uh, look at things. Um, I want to show you, not to teach you Hebrew, but to show you what the Hebrew says that should give us a bit more depth of the psalm. Now, this one here is NKJV. So I'm using NKJV as a base uh, Bible uh, that we use. And you would see what is shown here would be how the NKJV translates each of those Hebrew words. Uh, and, and let me just show you now. The first part of the psalm of verse 1 includes a title. So it says, a psalm, and a psalm actually is a song. Uh, this psalm is set to some melody, some poetry, uh, that it's supposed to be intended for singing. Now, we don't have the music word, so we, we won't be singing it, right? But it's a psalm of David. But I would submit to you that it is a psalm regarding David himself. It is not a psalm to David. It is a psalm uh, not only that he belongs to David or David is the author, but it is actually a psalm that is regarding the life of David, right? It is regarding the life of David. Now, as the psalm begins, verse 1 is only this portion here. And so you would always have that traditional wording, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And that, that's how the English is phrased all these years. So let me help unpack some of this. The focus is actually here. It's about God. And so we have in English, we translate according to the Jewish tradition. And the Jewish tradition 
uh, says that whenever you see the name of God or the proper name of God, the yod He vav He, which is right here, the yod He vav He, um, the Jews will not pronounce the word, but will will say it's Adonai, and hence we would translate it as Lord. But because this is a proper name of God, so we have caps, capital L O R D. Now, one of the biggest complaints that I've been having is this that if God is so important to us, shouldn't we actually know his name? And so I'll submit to you, not the purpose of today, but for you to investigate further, that we should know the name of God to call him and not be silent really because he is our God. And if he's our God, we should know his name. And I submit to you today, for our purposes, uh, that his name is Jehovah. So let's use Jehovah. Uh, many people call him Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahuwah, whatever that may be, uh, or the Lord. That's fine. Uh, but for the purpose of this, uh, this session, I will use the name Jehovah. So the focus is on God. Calling him Jehovah means you are very personal to God. You're not calling him at arm's length. You're not calling him with uh, a nickname that, that implies uh, it's, it's something else. So it says the Lord or Jehovah. And now we have this famous word, is my shepherd. And we think that this is a noun, uh, that, that he is the shepherd of our souls, is the shepherd of our lives. The 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 um, Hebrew uh, doesn't use the noun. The Hebrew uses a verb. In fact, it's a participle verb. I mean, those of you who study languages, it's an action word that is ongoing, and it actually means to feed, right? To graze, to shepherd, as a verb, not as a noun. So it should be translated as Jehovah is shepherding me or Jehovah is tending to the flock Jehovah is leading me to feed that's the concept of is my shepherd word in in the hebrew so if you look at this it will be Jehovah our god is the one who feeds me leads me as a sheep part of the flock to wherever i need to feed and he'll bring me there to eat to graze, okay, this will be a sheep, it will be grazing and not, we don't call it eating. So to graze, to feed on the grass. And the last part here is, I shall not want, meaning there is no lack. That I will not be short of food, I will not be short of grass because it is Jehovah who is leading this flock of sheep. And that's how verse 1 is seen as an action and not as a person. So the person is actually Jehovah. The person is not a shepherd. You would see the role of Jehovah leading the flock and bringing them to eat because it's a flock under his care. And David says, I will have no lack. No lack of what? In this case, no lack of food. Because everywhere I need food, Jehovah will lead me there. And that's how verse 1 is understood. So if you look at the bottom here, <clears throat> at the bottom would be verse 1. Jehovah is tending the flock and leading me to feed. And that would be the shepherding action. I will have no lack of food. So I shall not want. It's not about an old English name. I shall not want actually means I have no lack. Right? I have no need. Uh, what does it mean? I have no need. It means that the needs are met. And so I shall not want is actually an old English expression. And for our modern day usage, uh, I think it will be useful for us to understand that this whole picture is about Jehovah God leading a bunch of sheep and David is a part of it and because it is Jehovah leading the sheep there will be enough to eat and no complaint and that's 
verse 1. Moving on, we have verse 2. So we see the picture of Jehovah in verse 1. So it begins with Jehovah. That's how, that's how a man after God's heart, when he looks at pictures, the first picture that comes to mind is God. The first picture that comes to mind is not grass. Even though as a sheep, part of the flock of Jehovah, he doesn't look at grass. He looks at God. And so it begins with God. And that's how important God is to David. And I suppose because of that, that is why God calls him a man after his own heart. Now in verse 2, it continues the idea of verse 1. It is God doing the shepherding, the leading, the guiding. And so this is in two parts. This is one part and this is another part. So let's tackle one part by one part. The English tells us, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. One of the things you notice is that the English translation is trying to make us non-Hebrew readers to appreciate an English poetry. But that's not how a Hebrew poetry looks like. But because, well, we, we they, they don't want us to see Hebrew poetry. They want us to see English poetry. So the picture here would be this. The more important part would be here. He makes me to lie down is the verb. So let's focus on the verb. The, the verb would be like a lamb, like a sheep. You crouch down on the ground on all four legs. You are relaxed. You're made to rest. And that's what it means to make me lie down. It is not literally lying down and snoring away because you're still having the imagery of a sheep. So when a sheep is resting, the sheep don't lie on the side. The sheep will lie down on all fours and we call that crouching down. And it's to rest. Now this is what God, the one who is shepherding this flock will do. And David says, well, when I'm at my eating place. And what is my eating place? It is pastures. So in the English, it's called pastures. In the Hebrew, it means home, habitation, abode, a pleasant place, a beautiful place, a fitting place. So the English chose pastures. So if you look at it, it would be a home of grass. But not just any grass. This is Young grass, new grass, young sprouts, tender shoots, not the old grass, but young grass. And obviously, green pastures is how the English has translated it. And so here, if you understand the Hebrew a bit more, it is a, it's a pasture, it's a beautiful place, it's a home where there's lots of young grass because David, looking at himself, he is able to enjoy the, the, the green pastures or here, young grass pasture. And so we can understand this by the translation. He causes me to crouch down in home of young grass. And that's the first portion. So that's the imagery. Always remember, as I'm mentioning this to you, you have to think in your mind, ah, oh, this is a, uh, the sheep now resting, crouching down in his favorite spot of all the good food of young grass all around it. Second part, he leads me beside the still waters. And that's how we've always been singing the psalm. So again, the verb. The verb means to lead to a watering station and cause to rest there. So that's the whole picture of the action. The action is not just to lead, but leading with a purpose so that it will guide you to where there is water. And so you can now rest with water and grass. And so this is a waters. So you see waters, a watering spring, that's the name, beside this place. And it's not just water. The description of this place is a resting place, a peaceful place. 
a comfortable place, a quiet place. Now, which word is correct? I think all of it will give you a picture in your mind that now the sheep is led by God to green plant, green uh, grass that's young, that the, the sheep will love to eat. And also it will be beside some very peaceful water, not anxious, not rolling, but flowing, all right? And it is a spring and it is quiet and it is there that you can rest, eat and drink. And that's the whole picture. Now, eating and drinking in the Hebrew context is very similar to the Asian, maybe the, 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 the Chinese context, uh, always eating and drinking, right? Even the sheep needs to eat and drink. But here, for all the eating and drinking, David is saying, I don't have to worry because Jehovah God will take care of it and guide me there. You notice that the whole psalm is not saying God will feed you and open your mouth and drop grapes into your mouth. It's not that kind of a picture. It means that the sheep must follow the shepherd, go where the shepherd guides, rest where the shepherd rests, and be comforted that that's the best thing that the shepherd God himself has organized. And that's the picture of verses 1 and 2. And so it says, He guides me to a watering place and cause to rest there beside the waters of quietness. And so I hope verse 1 and verse 2 will give you that picture that God is the center of the picture and as sheep, David says, that he is not worried at all because he's got the best person for the job and he's happy, he's comforted, he's secure. He can say that there is nothing that he will lack. And so verse 2 describes what he won't lack, the eating of the young grass as well as the water to feed and drink. And that's the daily bread for the sheep. That's verse 2. Moving to verse 3. Verse 3 is interesting because verse 3 now talks about character. Now, we never think about character, but David speaks about character. It's in two parts again, and I will show you the two parts. One is here. And one is here. All right? So here in the first part, he leads me. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. It's not correct. The first part should be here. And the second part should be all of this. All right? Now with this, he restores my soul. The word restore itself uh, is uh, an action word that is in the present tense as an incomplete action. And the word restore actually means to bring back, to restore, to refresh, to cause one to repent. That's the same word. Okay? And what does the shepherd or this God, Jehovah God, tries to restore, to bring back? My soul. Now, my soul is a difficult word to translate. Uh, I must admit, the, the translators will have a hard time. This word is actually nefesh. And if you are not aware, you should be aware that the translators have so much problem translating nefesh that they would have used anything between 60 over different words to represent nefesh. And that's the complication of the word. But I would like to use and keep the word nefesh because it actually means the whole being, the person. Uh, and I'm not here to, to split hairs, whether it's a soul or whatever. It's the entire person. And it says here, Jehovah will bring back, restore to its original condition, this person that David says he is. That's the first part. He will bring back, right, my nefesh. He will refresh, restore. He will bring it back to its original state. I think that would be a good way of putting it. 
uh, to its original state. The second part begins with he leads me. He leads me is also an incomplete action and it actually means to guide and to lead. That's all. Meaning as somebody who is leading the flock concept, not as a warrior leader, not as a company leader, not as a judge, not as a king, but very much guiding a flock of sheep. Now, in describing the flock of sheep, you would see that the principles is actually very human character. Where is Jehovah guiding the sheep? In the way of what is right, righteousness, right? On the things which is right, just, rightness, justice. God is very concerned about things that is right before his eyes. He wants his people to do what is right. He wants people to do the things that is uh, just, that is fair. And hence, this is, he, he leads me in the tracks of his rightness. That's how I would put it. But you would get a picture here. Any of these words would mean, and, and all of them can mean the same, right? So, Jehovah God is guiding me. He will guide me if you will follow. So the sheep will always follow because it is Jehovah guiding. And which path are they going on? The right path. Right? After the original state, God is leading in the right path. Now, understand one thing in the Hebrew concept. The sheep needs to walk and follow. The sheep is not carried. Always have that in your picture, in your mind. You should never have a picture of anyone ferrying sheep in a truck or carrying on the backs. The sheep will follow and will follow in the right path. Why? What is the purpose of God doing that? And the English says, for the sake of his name. And so if you understand, for the sake means the purpose, the reason, right? To the end, because of. That is a reason of God leading the sheep to righteousness. Parts of righteousness means it, you have to walk, you have to live, you have to exhibit. Okay, There is effort involved. But more importantly is what is the purpose? The last word here is called shamo. It means name, his name. What about his name? For most of us, we don't even know his name. His name is the Lord. Is that his name? Which is why I kept emphasizing in verse 1, I think it is about time for us to find out what is his name because he is leading us in the path that is righteous for his name's sake. Now, name has a secondary meaning. Now, name would mean reputation, fame, glory, authority. In today's world, name is just a reference, a reference terminology. If you call him Tom, then it's Tom. What does Tom mean? Don't know. In fact, in our phones, it's just one, two, three, right? It's a phone number. That's his name. In the Hebrew context, name is very important and name reflects character. So I want you to understand that in this verse, in verse three, God is leading David and he is relating this concept that God is leading him to walk in righteousness in the past and he continues to go. Why? Because righteousness reflects the character of God. And so the sheep is to reflect the shepherd. The people of God is to reflect the character of God. So he will lead me in tracks of righteousness as a witness of his character. When people see Israel, they are supposed to see God. When Jesus says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When we are like David, that we walk and follow God in the paths of righteousness, we are to demonstrate righteousness. That's right. As that character. 
So in every day that we deal with people, uh, with friends, with neighbors, with children, with family, whoever, it is about righteousness. And why? Because that is who God is. That is verse 3. Now moving on to verse 4. Verse 4 is a fairly challenging translation for the Bible translators. And so it is in two parts. Again, you notice this entire psalm is always in two parts. The two parts is separated right here. Okay? The top part is, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And that's how we've always been singing the psalm. So let me just unpack this a little bit. Yea means, even so, moreover. Indeed, it is an exclamation to say, you know, this is true. This is the emphasis. Even. So what, what is the supporting emphasis? What is David trying to support? David is trying to show us in the song that Jehovah is leading him to everywhere to feed that he will have no lack. He restores and, and brings him back to where his original state is and then guides him to walk in righteousness so that it will reflect God himself. So, yea, truly, even, moreover, indeed, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And this is an interesting. Let me just share with you. Valley here doesn't mean your regular valley. Valley actually means a narrow gorge. Very narrow to walk, but it is narrow with high sides on both sides. In some cases, where it's described as a shadow of death or death shadow, that's what it means. Selim is a shadow, right? But it's a shadow of death. What is the shadow of death? And so many people have speculated. So I'll, I'll give you my take of it. This is about graves. That as you walk through this valley, a narrow pathway with sides on, uh, with high sides, these high sides generally are, are carved with holes where people bury the dead. And so this is the understanding that David is saying, even though when I walk through the path where there are graves on both sides of me, the shadow of death, I am not afraid. That's what, that's what uh, David is saying. I'm not afraid. Now this word afraid means be very afraid. It's the same word that many people say it's a reverential fear. It tells you, be afraid. So the text here says, I, I will not be afraid at all. Of what? Of Ra, evil. And it is translated as bad, calamity, misery, distress. So I'm not afraid of it stressing me. I'm not afraid of this event, walking through this narrow gorge to make me afraid of anything that will hurt me. That's the picture that David is painting here. The hurtful, the bad things that we call bad, right? Uh, the things that will cause us calamity, distress, anxiety. And so David says, I'm not going to be afraid of that. Even when you're walking into that area. Why? And so here, the second part, the first portion would be translated, even when I walk in narrow gorge with high sides of death shadow, and I am suggesting it will be graves, I will not be afraid of bad thing, whatever the bad thing you want to associate it with, right? So the imagination that you should have now is you're walking down the narrow valley, deep gorge, high sides, with holes that are filled with graves of other people, and you're saying, it's dark, but I will not be afraid of anything bad that will happen to me. That's the picture. That's the confidence that David has with Jehovah. Because he already said, 
Yehovah is leading me. Nothing to be afraid. Now understand, it is easy to sing the song, but David is actually expressing his actual relationship with God. The next section here is this. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The reason why David is saying, I'm not afraid at all, is because God is with me. With me actually means alongside me, beside me. I think that would be a good way of expressing it. So with me, alongside of me, uh, beside me, and that's where God is with David. This, this is how it's expressed. You are standing next to me. You're walking beside me. I have no, nothing to be afraid. Why? Because it says two things. Your rod and your staff. What is rod? A branch stick. What is staff? A support stick. A walking stick. So in the Hebrew, it is describing the same thing in two different ways. So basically, this would be the same thing, right? The same will console and comfort me. So the shepherd is not carrying two sticks. He's carrying one stick with two functions, but it is the same stick. So suddenly, you are beside me. Your branch stick and your support stick, the same consoles me. That's how the Hebrew expresses uh, the same thing, but describing two different functions of the same. And that's why David says, I'm not afraid. The shepherd, the one who's beside me, has a defense and a console mechanism. Why should I be afraid? So basically, it's like walking into a battle where you have somebody with all the super guns and whatever beside. So nothing to be afraid of. So that's how David as a sheep pictures God. Okay? Verse 5. Now verse 5 is also a bit difficult to translate. But this is the picture you get. The picture is very easy. Uh, there are two sections. Right, The first section is this, that you prepare before me a table in the presence of my enemies. And the preparation is actually a picture of God arranging a, a meal. Right? He's arranging a meal. He is laying it in order. He's putting it in a row. That's how it is set in the old days. That's the idea of preparing. Uh, the idea of a meal is that the, the whole table is spread out. And that's why you call it a table. So you prepare a table. Uh, that's the concept. So it, it need not be a literal table, but it would be a spread of a meal. And before me, it's in my face. That's how the Hebrew expresses it. Right in front of him, right before him. So when he says that I shall not want or have no lack, he is now describing how God is offering the food now in a more human uh, environment. As it's laid before, it is before his face. It is also here in the sight, in front of the people who is hostile against David. So David is now describing that even at this case, God is taking care of him. He is giving him all this lavish food, nothing more to lack. And in the presence that other people can see how God is blessing him. That's what it means by in the sight of those who oppose him. So if you remember, now David as a king has many enemies around him. That although the enemies are around him, they can see that God is with him and God is blessing him, and God is taking care of him in the sight of everybody. So the presence of God with David is not silent. It is not quiet. It is not invisible. The second portion is this. See, 
you will lay in all the meals spread out before my face in the sight of all those showing hostility towards me. The last part of this verse is this. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. That's how the King James, the New King James expresses it. So let us unpack this a little bit. The word to anoint in this case is to make fat, to fatten. It doesn't necessarily have to mean anoint as in anointing a king where you have a horn of olive oil and you pour over the head. That, that's not really what it means because we're talking about a meal here. You see here, it's a meal. We are now in the context of a meal at the table, spread it out with lots of food, but in the company, in the sight of all those who oppose David, but they can't participate in the meal. What can David do? David is saying this, you have make fat, you have dipped in my best, the, the, the best things in my life, you have dipped in fat or oil or richness and you've made it fat. That's the expression right here. Okay? It's not about pouring oil over his head. It's about the things that he's eating, the choices, food that he's got in the spread. It is actually made even more fat by dipping it in fat. Now, I guess when you read this, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a carbo nightmare. Uh, a cholesterol nightmare, <laughs> but in the, in the Hebrew, fat is the best part of the meat. And so God says, you should reserve that for me. So this whole statement here is about the best food for David. God has made it even fatter. That's, he has the best and it became better. Right? That's the picture here. So you fatten my best in fat. That's literally what it means. And then it says, my cup runs over. So it is a portion that is saturated, satisfied, drink to one's fill. There's so much in the cup that you can drink and drink and drink and drink. And it's still there. That's the picture. Runs over appears to be our modern day thinking. But it's a cup where you drink that you cannot finish and you have been filled, it is still full. So it is a picture of satisfaction, to be satisfied, right? My cup is abundantly satisfied. So you understand that verse five is about God preparing all the best things in life for David. So it describes the food, it describes the drink. So food and drink, food and drink. But this time round, not a sheep, but as a king. In the final verse, we have this statement here. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And that's one portion. So let's unpack this a little bit. The word surely is an affirmation. Uh, David is saying, I am so assured, I am very certain, I'm making an affirmation. Indeed, God will do this. And that's the picture of ach, right? It's surely, that, that's the, the traditional way we translate it. But just understand that this is an emphasis by David that he is so sure. Isn't that faith? A man after God's heart, knowing God in this manner. So it is about that relationship with God, right? Goodness means things that is good, that's agreeable, things that function properly. So David is saying, hey, all the things that God is agreeable with, all the things that work well, and mercy, in this case, is about kindness. It's haset, faithfulness. But it's a picture of being bowed down in recognition that, yeah, we are going to bestow kindness upon David. It's a very beautiful sight. So all the beautiful things 
and all the good things shall follow me. And the idea here is to chase and run after David. So that's a picture. So that word shall follow me is not to walk after, but it gives a more active picture of chasing after you. So it's like a Doberman behind you. And it's called goodness and mercy. So there are two Dobermans, one called mercy and one called goodness. So the beautiful things in life, the good things in life, the things that is proper for, for David will be chasing after David. Why? Because David knows God this way. And how long will this last? The English tradition says all the days of my life. It literally means every day. It also literally means the entire remaining days of his existence. And so David is painting a picture which many people are missing, that his life with God is that close. And he is describing one that is with God, beside God, not as a song, but in real terms in his life. And so he ends by these words. So it's most definitely things that are agreeable to God and things that are beautiful to God will run after me every day of my life. But the final words come this way. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so I will dwell gives you a picture of return. Go back. Because it's the same root word as repent, as restore. right? And I will restore myself. I will bring myself back. But in this case, it is no longer a future tense. It is a past tense. He has already come back to God. Now, if this was a picture of his sin, then it would be a picture after that has occurred. To say that now I know God even better, I have returned. I have come back to where? The house of the Lord. The house of the Lord has a few variable meanings. The home of God, the place where God is, the presence of God. And in some cases, it's like Sheol. It's the afterlife where God has, uh, that God has appointed. But perhaps you would say that David, if this was a case of a restoration of his sin, that he has now come to his senses, he has now returned to the presence of God, the home of Jehovah represents the presence of God. Now the description is how long, and here is to length of days, which is the same construct as this, right? That Goodness and mercy, what is beautiful and good, will chase after him the rest of his days. And now he has come back and he's sure of that. He is back in the presence of God for the length of his days. So the last verse 6 in two sentences are talking about the same thing. For the same duration and is describing his relationship again. In the home of Jehovah, of God. He begins with Jehovah God. He ends with Jehovah God. And so I hope you can see that Psalm 23 is not a simple psalm, but it gives us simple nuggets in a very broad and deep perspective. It actually is intended to play this video in our minds so that you can see the motion of the relationship where David is a sheep following God wherever he leads to the path of righteousness to demonstrate his character as a king who prepares for him, lays out the banquet and a, a, a grand feast that's more than enough for him to eat and to drink right before the eyes of those who are against him. And he will be seen to be the blessed. And now following this, he is so sure he is going to be with God. And if he is in the presence of God, goodness and mercy is a natural. 
you cannot ask for goodness and mercy without being in the presence of God. And if you're in the presence of God, this will chase after you. And that is how David understands his relationship with Jehovah, that he knows his name. He actually writes his name right here, right? He has the name of God there, except that today we don't pronounce it and the Jews tell us that we should not pronounce it and so we should keep quiet about it and call him Lord. So I'm suggesting that if we are to learn to be like David, a man after God's own heart, it begins with a personal relationship with Jehovah God and it ends by acknowledging that in his presence is where is best. That, in a nutshell, is Psalm 23. And so, in closing, I want to read this to you. This is the translation that we have put together. And it reads this way. A psalm regarding David. Jehovah. So it begins with Jehovah. He knows God. is tending the flock and leading me to feed. I will have no lack of food. He, Jehovah, causes me to crouch down in home of young grass. He guides me to a watering spring and causes me to rest there beside the waters of quietness. He will bring back my nefesh, my whole being. He will restore and bring it back to the original state. He will lead me in tracks of rightness as a witness, as a testimony of his character. Even when I walk in a narrow gorge with high sides of death shadow of graves, I will not be afraid of any bad thing. Certainly, you, Jehovah, are beside me. Your branch stick and your support stick, everything that's needed for a shepherd and for the taking care of the sheep, the same will console me. And here as a king, Jehovah, you will lay in order a meal spread out in my face in the sight of those showing hostility towards me. You fatten my best. In fact, my cup is abundantly satisfied. Most definitely, things that are agreeable to God and things that are beautiful to God will run after me every day of my life and I will return and I return in the home of Jehovah, in the presence of Jehovah for the rest of my life. That would be Psalm 23, uh, in a nutshell, hoping that this should help unpack a little. And with this, uh, this is the end of the presentation. Yeah. Okay, if not, uh, if not, thank you very much uh, for joining me. I hope that we can meet again another day. Hopefully next week, I'll send an invitation out. But I hope that you get uh, more encouraged from Psalm 23 because it is really about relationship with God, who God is, uh, by His name, Jehovah, and what He will do with somebody that He leads and takes care and who is obedient to Him and comes back to Him and reflects His character and so on and so forth. And and that whole picture is a beautiful picture of David and his relationship with God. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.